So we're in the book of James right now, and it looks like we'll be here for a few years. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. We're in chapter one, verse five. We're going to finish off an incredible passage from last week where James talks about this beautiful invitation from God to ask for wisdom when we need it. I love how practical and nitty-gritty the Bible can be because we need it to be that. It's not just these high and lofty abstract thoughts, you know, philosophical principles about who God is. It gets down in just to the nitty-gritty hard things of everyday life. And in this particular verse, he's talking about, hey, what do you do when you get to the end of your rope and you don't know what to do? We, when you need wisdom. When you're facing a situation that you've probably tried it on your strength, you've tried all of your best options, and it's just not happening. You need wisdom. And there's this incredible passage where James, in just a very point-blank, here it is, tells us there's a solution. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. And so it's just this beautiful truth about the heart of God is you're not going to get in trouble to go ask God for wisdom. That's what that word reproach means, by the way. If you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. You're not going to get in trouble to go to God and ask for wisdom. In fact, he puts this this little nugget in here, generously. He gives generously, and that's where we, we get a little taste of the heart of God. God's up, not up there like a stingy miser who's going to be mad and get you in trouble when you say, God, I don't know what to do with this situation in my life. Help me. In fact, it's the opposite. He's saying God is generous. God wants to provide your problems with heavenly solutions. It honors God. He wants to bring heavenly solutions. And so we can, we can fortify our, our heart and our mind with this great truth that every problem has a heavenly solution. And when we're at the end of our rope, that's actually a good thing because that's where, that's where God comes in. He wants us to get to the our, end of our rope quickly and say, God, I need your wisdom and let God bring a heavenly solution. So that was last week. And as we move on in the verse, it actually kind of shifts quickly to something very challenging. And so the Bible's full of great news and comforting verses and comforting truths about who God is. And then you can come across those verses that are like, bam, here's a challenge. Here's a high standard. And we get right there quickly with James. So let's check it out. We'll read the, well, starting in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. It will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Ouch, yeah, that's a strong, a strong word. That's a high standard. So you got this picture of God wants to generously give his wisdom. He wants to provide a heavenly solution. Whatever problems you face, there is a heavenly solution, and he loves to generously share those. But when you ask, don't doubt it. Don't doubt that he wants to give it to you. Don't doubt that there's a heavenly solution and he generously can't wait to share it. That's a high standard. I mean, there's no way around it. That's a high standard. And so the, the important question that immediately follows 
in this passage or in any other one, frankly, in the Bible, especially the New Testament, where you see high standards. The, the standard here is trust that God wants to give his wisdom. Don't doubt it. That's a high standard. So when you face those kind of high standards, how do you process them? I would suggest that there's probably two main ways of processing high standards. And the one that you do, the path that you take, will have a dramatic effect on your life and really have a dramatic effect on who you understand God to be and how you perceive and understand your walk with God in this life. One way to see high standards that are all throughout the Bible, and once you see them, they're there, those high standards can be seen as part of a religious system in which a pseudo-boss-like God is putting heavy burdens on you and all of us of rules that you constantly have to live up to. And so there's this sense of heavy burden. I'm not good enough. I know I should be. I know those are the standards. I know those are the rules. Oh, it's heavy, and I'm just constantly going through life feeling like I, I, can't, I can't be good enough. That's one way to receive, interpret, and live out high standards. As you may guess, I don't think that's the right way. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. There's another way. High standards can be also seen and received as an invitation into a deeper relationship with God who desires to bring you and I more fully alive and transformed to actually, in this life, become more and more like Christ by His grace. Or another way to more succinctly put it is... You can either see these high standards as rules to live up to or a way of life that you get to live into. This is a deep, deep question, deep topic, so I want to take a little bit of time here to kind of unpack this. We're going to go to Jesus in the moment, or in a moment, who's always the source that we want to end up at when we're forming a perspective about who God is and who we are and the life that God wants for us. But I'd like to submit to you that any place in the New Testament, especially, where commands are given or high standards are set or described, where there's a high level of character in a person that's, that's called for or demanded, what you might even call a, a holiness in a person. Very high character standards. And there's actually a lot of them. They are not written as rules to make you feel bad, burdened, and heavy about yourself because it's this standard that's just out of reach that you're never going to get to. They are meant to be an invitation into the type of person you can be transformed to and are being transformed to in this life by God's grace in your life. Let me give you an example. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that sounds like a high standard that you can't live up to. But I'm going to show you in the text that is not what Jesus is thinking. In the midst of this text, this is a larger body of teaching 
that Jesus is famously known for giving, often called the sermon. So in the midst of this famous sermon where Jesus is laying forth all sorts of different actions or ethics of this new kingdom that he's talking about, the kingdom where God reigns on earth as it is in heaven, and he's the ambassador of it, he's the inaugurator of it, he's, he's showing us what that looks like. So he's laying forth all the ethics of this new kingdom. But to put that in very common, everyday language, in this sermon, Jesus is talking about all sorts of just nitty-gritty life situations. He's talking about anger. He talks about lust. He talks about divorce. He talks about telling the truth. He talks about responding to evil. He talks about responding to enemies. And he's just getting started. But think about those topics. That's where we live every day, where we've got questions. We've got choices. We've got standards. How am I going to respond? Anger, lust, telling the truth, evil that's around me, bad people that are hurting me. What am I going to do? So he's talking about all these different nitty-gritty life situations and the whole premise of all of these things that he brings up is that when God reigns in your life you are going to be able you're going to be transformed to be able to respond in a way that was never possible before but with God in your life you can do it right before he talks about and we got to get this context for a moment then we'll get into a specific right before he says be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect he talks about like i said anger lust divorce truth telling responding to evil responding to enemies and all of those things he does issue a very high standard and it's like, well, how do we not see that as then just this burden that we can't live up to? This, oh my gosh, I, wow, yeah, just make me feel like an idiot. I, yeah, I, I do all that stuff in the wrong way. And there is the reality, the truth, that if you want to talk about the big picture, so a little side note, the big picture of salvation, yes, the Bible is very clear for all have fallen short all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god none of us will ever be perfect on our own strength so salvation and relationship with god and becoming a new creation becoming a child of god is not us working up to it it's receiving that christ is the only perfect one ever so by grace we are saved through faith not by works so it, so that no one can boast so that's where that relationship with God begins. But that doesn't discount that in this passage, when Jesus says, be perfect because your heavenly father is perfect, he means it. He really does. And how do we know that? Because he doesn't just set a high standard in any of those topics mentioned, and there's many more mentioned. He doesn't just set a high standard and leave it. In every single situation, and you can go back and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, in every single situation where Jesus puts forth this high standard, he also, right then and there, puts forth what you might call a transforming practice of how you can partner with God to be transformed and actually live into this high standard in your life now. Let me give you an example. The first nitty-gritty human issue that Jesus addresses is anger. So let's just start with the first one. And you could go to any of them in this sermon, and you'll see the, the framework or the repeated pattern of Jesus introducing a high standard of the kingdom of God and then a transforming practice where he's inviting you to say, partner with God's grace and watch your life be transformed to be more like Christ. So let's just take anger. Chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
So those are quotes from the Old Testament. That's a high standard. So Jesus not only quotes the Old Testament, he's about to make the standard even higher. And then he goes on to say, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So the Old Testament standard was don't murder anybody. That, that's way off course of what God wants for your life. And Jesus ups the standard and says, don't even be angry with anybody. Okay, so I've got a heavy burden right now. <laughs> you know, Like that's, wow, I, I, how could I live up to that? So there's a certain aspect, yes, it draws me to my knees where I realize like I need the grace of God and that, that there's a truth in that. But let's not miss that from this passage, that's not Jesus's primary intention. He may get to that, that incredible truth in other places, but in this passage, he is laying forth a standard that he really believes you can live into. How do we know it? Well, what comes next? Verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift right there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. That is a transforming practice. There's a high standard of where, yeah, he's saying, get rid of anger in your heart. But he doesn't say it to make you feel bad about, oh, just as these are the rules and regulations that in this religious system you've got to live up to or, or you're never going to be accepted by God. God's never going to love you until you get this all right. And so just this constant living under burdens of, uh-oh, I gotta follow all the rules and regulations in my life. He goes on to give a transforming practice that's gonna actually help you and me get the anger out of our life. It's the way that we can partner with God because God has this new kingdom that's breaking in that Jesus is saying, it's like nothing the world has ever seen. The amount of grace that God is pouring out on humanity by sending his spirit, first his son, perfect life, death, resurrection, and now his spirit to regenerate our hearts, to make us new people, to make us new creations, where our destiny in this life is to be conformed more and more to the actual image and nature of Christ. So the way that you can partner with that abundant grace that's flowing from heaven is to do certain transforming practices that are going to actually help you get rid of the anger in your life. So he goes on to say, so if you're offering the gift at your altar and remember that somebody's got something, stop what you're doing and go face it. And in that, there's a promise. My grace is going to be with you. So you don't have to come to church and just go through the motions of going, you know, I'm here at the altar, Lord, while my life's a mess and I got all these broken relationships and I don't know what to do with them and I can't do it on my own strength. And now it's like, okay, now you're getting somewhere because when you come to the end of your strength, guess whose strength wants to, to come in? Guess whose wisdom wants to come in? But you got to partner with me. Go face it and watch my grace do things in you that you never thought were possible. That's Jesus' message in this. He really believes that by his grace, by the presence of his spirit in your life, you not only are just not gonna murder people, by God's grace, you can actually get rid of anger in your life. And that that's part of the good news of the kingdom. It's not a rule to live up to. It's an invitation that you get to live into. It's a new way of life that God in Christ is making possible for you. Jesus really believes that you can do this. Are you with me? The, that's good news. <laughs> All these high standards, we're going to get back to James. These are not simply rules to live up to and feel bad that you can never get to. Rather, it's a new kingdom way of life that you get to live into. 
I mean, Sermon on the Mount is unbelievably good news. As you, when you see it this way, that it's over and over as he's dealing with all these hard, nitty gritty things of life, instead of just more and more burdens of, oh, I could never do this or I can't do this. Well, you can't, but when you partner with God, you can actually be transformed and live into this type of Christ-like person. God wants to make you powerful in that way. He wants to make you Christ-like. So you're more and more living in victory over those things. And so when we get to James, he's saying something very similar. I'll admit, though, it's in a very point-blank fashion. James, at, at, at times, is he's kind of a hard pill to swallow. He's like a super point-blank, here's the truth, it might knock you over, but it's good for you, <laughs> type you know, type guy. So in James 1, 5 to 8, when we're talking about all this stuff and he lays out that very high standard of when you ask God for wisdom, don't doubt. Let me give a, a, a quick little paraphrase, if you will. What I believe he's saying to us is, so here's the goal. When it comes to needing wisdom in our life, have faith in God in such a way that you believe that he has all the necessary answers you're looking for. He has the heavenly solutions and he wants to give them to you. He wants to generously share his heavenly solutions with you. Don't doubt that. That's the goal. That's where we want to be transformed into. And I think that's the moment of grace where we need to keep these different tensions in Scripture in perspective. James lays forth a high standard. So anytime we see these high standards, how do we process it again? And this is one of those moments where we need to remember the big picture and process that this is not just a rule to live up to and feel bad. If it's in there, it's because... God, it's part of God's gracious will for my life that he believes I can actually live into it. But a hugely important piece to remember is, but that's a journey. It is a process. There is grace for the journey. And I want to point out something very crucial that I believe can be very encouraging to us that in a way softens a little bit of James's very, you know, blunt, strong language of high standards that are true, but how do we keep the big picture of the journey in mind? So something crucial, even, courage, even encouraging to remember along the way about the, the real journey and essentially growing into this type of trust in God where, and confidence in God that we're not doubting that he wants to share his heavenly solutions. One encouragement that I take is that knowing who James is, this book was written by the brother of Jesus. And even James, the author of this book, the brother of Jesus, had his own journey of faith where he stumbled along the way and doubted big time. Let me give you an example. In Mark chapter 3, there's a whole long passage that kind of makes it really clear, so I'll paraphrase a little and then read some of the verses. 13 to 34 is the big chunk. So it says that Jesus went up on a mountainside and he prayed. He spent, spent a whole night alone from all of the, the ministry, outward workings that he was doing. He got alone on a retreat with God the Father to, to pray, to listen, to seek God's you know, wisdom, if you will. He was asking in that those making those final decisions of who who are my twelve? Who should I choose to be those twelve? Out of all my disciples, out of all those who are following me, who have you called to be closest to me? So it says he went up 
on a mountainside, he called to him those whom he wanted. Interesting. They came to him. He appointed them that they might be with him and, might, and he might send them out to preach, to have authority to drive out demons. And these are the 12. Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. He, to them he gave the name Sons of Thunder. That's a cool nickname. You know, if Jesus nicknames you that, you're feeling pretty good. By the way, Jesus has names for all of us. We, that's those, we've been to those messages. There's an identity, a destiny, li- similar to Sons of Thunder that he wants to bestow upon all of us. Anyways, a- Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So he picks his people. That's a bold move. That is a bold move. So for a carpenter, a mason, who Jesus was, he is positioning himself as a spiritual leader, as a rabbi. He has chosen 12. So, I mean, this is, this is big time. In, I mean, if you're a first century Jew, seeing this, watching this happen, he just took a level of bold, confident, I am taking 12. I am now acting as a spiritual leader for the people. I am discipling intentionally this, this whole rabbinic way. It's a very serious thing. So that's part of what we got to see is happening here because that's part of how his brother, James, responds to this. So Jesus takes this bold position of 12 who are going to follow him. He is going to be their rabbi. He is going to be their spiritual master. He is going to show them a way of following God, and they're going to, as best they can, do everything just like him. Bold move for a carpenter. Verse 20, it picks up. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered. So he's coming down the mountain. Another one of the Gospels tells us this is actually Peter's house. So Jesus has now, in a sense, set up a spiritual headquarters with his new tribe, his new followers, his his disciples. He's the leader. He's got his spiritual home base. So he's operating out of Peter's house as like this epicenter of his you know, his spiritual movement. When Jesus entered a house, again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. So it, the rumblings of a revival are happening. This is where it gets interesting. Verse 21. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. So the same guy who's writing this book and says, don't doubt, is the same guy who sees Jesus, his brother, claiming this place of spiritual authority, setting up a spiritual headquarters, and seeing all these people come, hear his teaching, be prayed for by him, and his family's conclusion is, our brother is out of his mind. We need to go there and physically grab him and take him back home. Would you consider that doubt? (laughs) And Jesus responds as it's made known to him that his mother and brothers have arrived in verse 31. Standing outside, they sent someone to call him in. So they're there. I mean, they're on a mission. His mother, his brothers are on a mission to go there to rescue him from himself. Take him home. He's crazy. He's lost it. So they gather outside. They try to get his attention. And Jesus responds. A crowd was sitting around him. And they told him, your mothers and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and brothers. For a first century young Jewish boy to say, who are my mother and brothers? I mean, Wow, it is, you, you couldn't be more offensive to the culture, to the tradition, to the family. And Jesus is saying, hey, there's bigger things going on here. If you're not with me, you're against me. There is a, there's a kingdom that I am about my father's business. And right now you're on the outside. You're not even my mother and my brothers. Wow. And James has no objections. (laughs) 
because his faith isn't there yet. He hasn't had those encounters with God yet. He is doubting who Jesus is and what he's about. That is a low point. It's doubt. It's unbelief. It's stumbling. It's being tossed by the winds and the challenges of life. It's being that unstable, double-minded man that James talks of. So is James saying this as his high standard because he's sitting on his high horse? Or is he saying this from his own testimony of, I, I, I've been here. I know what it's like to doubt and be double-minded and be tossed to and fro by the challenges of life. And man, there is a better way. When you get to encounter God in a way where you know his goodness and his kindness and his mercy and you have a confidence in you where you can go to him and know and ask for wisdom and know with a confidence that he wants to give it to you because he's good, man, that's a better way to live. I think that's what James is getting after. I mean, when you think about it, who who really wants to be unstable. <laughs> yeah, I, want, I, I love going through life unstable, tossed to and fro by various perspectives and pseudo-truths and challenges, and I just get beat up all over the place. I don't know what truth is. I don't really know what God's like. And I have this deep insecurity in me. I'm unstable. I, I, I just have no anchor points. When, when life gets hard and the nitty-gritty stuff comes my way, I just don't have those anchor points of confidence where I can say, I know this is who God is, so I'm just getting kind of beat up by life. I mean, who wants to live that way? And James's good news is God doesn't want you to live that way either. That's not part of the good fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's not part of the abundant life of his kingdom reigning in you. He wants to get you to the place where you don't doubt. That you can come to him with a confidence of a beloved child. And you can say, God, I need wisdom. And you can believe he's generous. He wants to give it to you. And I'll just take a quick little example of, my, of being a parent and and how Jesus draws so many parallels with our relationship with God in these parental pictures, these images. He wants us to know he's a good father. Any of you, even though you're evil, if you have children who asks you for a stone or for bread, are you going to give them, or for bread or for fish, are you going to give them a stone or a snake? No. Man, your heavenly father is so much better than you. <laughs> so if that's your impetus to give good gifts, how much more? your father in heaven. He says, he says all sorts of things like that. And I think just one example the other day, this was probably two weeks ago. So my, my oldest son messed up his ankle playing football and he comes home and it's like, you know, swollen to the point that you can't see the bone. And my wife is known in the family as like, she's like the doctor. You know, she's got a cure for everything. And so he comes and he's like, mom, what do we do with this? And she's like, oh, I got it. You know, obviously the ice and stuff. And she's like, but I'm going to make you some chicken soup. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's mom's answer, right? But if you actually, this is not like open the jar of, of chicken soup. Like that stuff's trash. There's a reason why chicken soup is actually famous. If you make chicken soup from, from like homemade with an actual chicken in the soup, I know it's weird. <laughs> I know it's weird. But if an actual chicken gets boiled in a pot, there are tremendous health benefits. It sucks out the marrow and you boil it, like the, the nutrients of the marrow is unbelievably good for you. The chicken feet in itself have a tremendous amount of collagen in them and silica, which actually repairs joints and bones. So I mean, you could go the whole like you're sick and you wanna get better, there's that nutrient side it's incredibly good for you with all the marrow that gets sucked out that's why they do bone marrow transplants and but if you want to talk about healing an ankle there is a collagen in there and actually you can see it after you cook it and let it and let it uh cool there's like this jello like jello gelatinous stuff that is like crazy thick that is a very natural remedy that God has provided to go into a body that will m rapidly speed up the healing of ankles, bones. It strengthens your bones, strengthens your hair, your nails. Don't eat too much. You start to get like wolverine claws, you know. <laughs> My wife's like, your nails are so hard. I'm like, I'm eating your chicken soup. Um, 
Anyways, long story short, enough of that. So she pumps him with like, you know, a week's worth chicken soup every day for, for dinner. It's good. He's feeling better. But what's, what's where it gets real is, okay, so we did that. No question. My wife's like, boom, I want to do this for you. Let's say we finish off the chicken soup. His ankle is still not quite there. He's made some good progress, but he had another game. Some, you know, big old, like, dude, like, rolled on his ankle. He's kind of hurting again. Are we going to be mad if he comes back and says, you know what, Mom? Man, that soup you made healed my ankle. Felt so good. Would you, would you make some more? You know what, Mom? I think you care about me. I think you love me. Would you make me some more of that stuff that healed me? I mean, I'm adding a couple words. But, I mean, what parent is going to be like, how dare you ask for more soup? I just made you soup. You ungrateful little monkey, I just made you soup. It honors my wife. It honors her care for him. It honors the, the time, the effort, the hours, the energy that she put in as an act of love to care for him, to make him better, It honors that. It glorifies that, if you will. Follow the analogy. It glorifies it for him to come back and say, man, that was so good. Thank you for loving me. Could I have some more? It shows an honoring of the care and compassion that is her reason for doing it. Flowing out of her is care and compassion put in action. And it honors that to come back for more and say, can I have some more? You see, you see. Let's, let's, let's do the opposite here. If he were to come back and say, in this fearful, timid, like, oh, could, could, could I have some more? I know, I, 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 I know, I know, I, I know, I know. You made me, you made me one batch, but you know, uh, could I have some more, please? Like, I'm really, I'm really hurting. I, I know, I know. I'm sorry. It's too much, isn't it? It's too much. Would, would an insecure, begging, fearful child, does that honor the character of his mother? No. That says something bad. If he's scared to come to her, if he's doubting that she cares that much, if he's kind of cowering, like, oh, that's too much, and now I just kind of have to beg and throw it out there and run because you're mean, that dishonors who she is, the love, the care, compassion that's not going anywhere. In fact, she's honored and glorified that he asked again because it's saying, you're the source of what I need and she's happy to pour out more. That's what the Bible's getting at when it's saying, don't doubt. Don't doubt that God is a good heavenly father who wants to give wisdom graciously graciously, undeservedly. That's like a picture of a fountain that just keeps flowing. It's there. He wants to give wisdom graciously. Don't doubt that. And so we have these, you know, these images in our life where, we, oh, I can't ask God again. Or, oh, I got to kind of beg him. I'm scared. You know, I don't, I don't know if he really cares. So I'm just going to throw out a little weak prayer. If you care, God, if it's your will, if you want to, you know, look my direction a little bit, I'm hurting over here. That dishonors God. That is not worship. That does not glorify his nature, his character as the good father who is delighted, who do generously give wisdom to those who ask. I mean, it's a great word that James said generously. It's not stingy. You're not bothering him. He's not up there like, oh gosh, this idiot again. I tried already once giving him wisdom and they screwed it up. Gives generously. That's his nature. It's his character. I just want to close with with one verse to to meditate on for a moment. In Romans 8.32, Paul drives this home where he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's the kind of encounter with God's nature that James had. He must have had that to change his life. How do you get to that place of confidence that James has where he's saying, you don't need to doubt this. 
You get there by encountering God's nature. How do we know he encountered God's nature? Two verses later, he puts forth one of the most beautiful descriptions of God's nature, one of my favorites, in all of the Bible, where he says that God is the father of heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift in life is from him. He has no darkness in him. He has no shadow. He never changes. Don't be deceived. Wow. That's a man who's encountered the nature of God. So somewhere along his doubting and stumbling and not having it all together, he encounters God, which is good news for all of us, by the way. He encounters God probably more than once in multiple ways to the point where now he has this triumphant declaration as a man who thought Jesus was crazy and had to go rescue him from himself and take him home to say, oh my gosh, God is the father of heavenly lights. He's the giver of all good gifts. There's no darkness in him. Don't, don't be deceived by that. Or about that. That's a man who's had encounters. And those encounters with God's nature have given him the confidence that as a beloved son, God generously gives, and you don't have to doubt it. And that's an example of how when there's high standards, it's an invitation into the type of life you get to live into in this new way of life with God. Let's take a moment, and I want to put up that verse in Romans 8. And I just want us to give just two minutes of quiet where you just look at that verse and just ask, Holy Spirit, show me a new depth of how true this is, or show me a place in my life, a, a problem where I need your wisdom, where I need your provision, and help root in the depths of my being that this is your nature. That if I can believe that you gave your one and only son, which was the greatest sacrifice we, anyone could possibly imagine, then I can believe that you care about every other thing in life too. And you want to graciously give us all things. And when that becomes more and more real, you become a confident kid in God's presence where doubt seems less and less reasonable, if you will. Let me pray for a moment. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would do that gracious work you love to do of helping us encounter your nature so that we are transformed to be more like you, Christ. And I pray that your Spirit would just in these couple minutes right here lead our hearts as we meditate, as we ponder this incredible truth of Romans 8.32, we just pray that for each and every person here, this would be a personal moment and your Holy Spirit would lead them. Maybe there's something specific you want to say out of a different part of the message. Maybe there's a deep truth from this passage itself. But we pray that you would speak to us, Lord. Thank you that you love to do that. May we hear your voice for this morning and and know clearly how we can respond, partner with you, say yes to what you're wanting to do in a fresh way in our life. So Holy Spirit, have your way. I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. I will dance a new dance like David.